good to be here at the 35th Congress. Um, today um, we have a lecture regarding something that interests me particularly very well since I am I'm as well very keen to give my toys, tools and so cars, computers and whatever is surrounding me a name. And uh, so we're going to discuss actually, we're going to have a lecture that's called Our Machines Famine. I don't know how it exactly comes, but most of my machines are famine as well. My car, my computer. And once in a while I have to touch them and really treat them well. Maybe that's the kind of behavior that I have towards these things. Then it's maybe as well because of my twisted mind that I consider these machines as being, um, uh, you have to take care about them, otherwise you can do really weird things. But this lecture then is actually about exploring the relations between design and perception of machines and the dynamics in between. The lecture is provided by Polaris and uh, she will take, it's she in this case I may say, she will take uh, actually an angle at the examination about how we map gender on computers and machines. Uh, we will look a little bit into the software uh, in machine-human interaction, as well a really interesting field there, the relationship in between, and we'll, we, will, we will dig a little bit deeper in the cultural history of imagining and building human-like machines. I would love to see Polaris here on stage. Please, ladies and gentlemen, give her a warm welcome. <laughs> Polaris. Thank you all for coming today. I know it's early and it's on the last day, so I appreciate that you're here. On the other side, I do feel a bit pressured to uh, make your time worthwhile um, as much essentially in at such an early hour in the day. So uh, let's start. I would like to introduce someone to you. This is my assistant, Ducky. Um, I will come back to him if I stumble on my words or if I'm too nervous, then he will bail for me. So let's go get going with the talk. Are machines feminine? Why did I ask that question? I observed that in cars, smartphones, and computers, when we have a voice synthesis, that a lot of these voices tend to be female. I wondered about that because machines per se do not have a gender on which we could map that to. Although one could argue, what is gender? We might get to that point later on. And before I start off uh, with my short take on um, history, two uh, disclaimers. One, I cannot talk about the entirety of how uh, we relate gender to machines. That's a really big field. So I have narrowed it down, in this case, on voices, because this is something I know more about. And secondly, I will talk about some movies and books. I will spoil all of them. I'm sorry, but I'm very appreciative of your, of your attention most of the time, but particularly in that case, you can just let it slip if you don't want, if you don't want the thing spoiler that I mentioned. So, let's begin with some history. Anthropomorphizing machines is by no means something new. This is a painting um, by Jean Lerome Girard, a French artist, who, which depicts um, a story from Greek mythology called Pygmalion and Galatea. And this story is about uh, a guy, Pygmalion, who is disappointed by all of womanhood, yet they really don't live up to his expectations, might be because of his expectations. And therefore he goes into his workshop, he's a sculptor, and he makes his own perfect woman out of marble. But well, I didn't think he thought that through to the end because she can't love him back, she's a stone. Then, then he despairs and he cries and the goddess Aphrodite 
has mercy with him and lets this stone woman come to life and they ha live happily ever after, so I think. That's, an, that's not as common in Greek mythology, so that's, that's a point. But what this story depicts here is a trope that I would say I found again and again in science fiction of the later centuries, where we have a masculine creator that creates a feminine creation or machine. What you see here are actually two examples from technological history. The thing on your left is a so-called karakuri ningyo. That is, I, I guess I butchered that um, pronunciation, but I try. This is an automata from the 17th century in Japan. These were um, small figures that could move around when you put a little teacup onto the plate that they were holding. Then an internal mechanism would get them going and they would roll across the room to the guest you wanted to serve your tea to. On the other hand side, we see another kind of automata. Um, this one is called La Joueuse de Tympano. Um, it was a music-making automata, and she had a, a kind of a dulcimer, that's the instrument is called. Um, it's something like a piano, just without the keys, and you would just like tap on the strings. What I already found interesting about these machines, um, they will usually, or at the beginning, um, clockwork, um, clockworks that were just, uh, we had clocks, and then uh, the engineers who built them made little figures that would also be powered by the clockwork and would move around. And then this um, got uh, innovated more and more, and up to the point that we had um, figures that were um, do other things than telling the time. From uh, this epoch, we have automata which can play the piano, which can um, draw things, and which can also write things. Roughly the same time, uh, looking at literature, how these machines were imagined. Um, on your left side, we have the Sandman, or the Sandman, from E.T.A. Hoffmann, which is mostly a story about childhood and fear, but it also features a protagonist called Nathanael, or Nathaniel, who falls in love with a woman. She, she doesn't really respond to him, she doesn't really speak with him, maybe she's not the talkative type, but they dance together, they play piano together, and she's a bit stiff, and in the end, he uh, recognizes, oh no, it's a machine, it's not really a woman, built by the antagonist of the story. On the other side, we have Tomorrow's Eve. Although I'm not very happy with the themes that are, or the way that the themes are played out in the story, I think it's fascinating, because to me, it seems something like the first science fiction fan fiction of its time. It features Thomas Edison, who builds a robot girlfriend for an Englishman he owes a favor to. And this was at the time where Thomas Edison was still alive. Yes, this Edison who built the light bulb. And again, in these stories, you see this, I, or I see this stereotype of like the masculine inventor who builds a feminine machine to serve his needs or execute his commands. Roughly at the same time, mid of the 19th century, we have this little thing. This is the euphonia, and this is one of the earliest speaking machines. This um, device tried to emulate how humans speak on a mechanical level. For that, I would shortly explain how speaking as such works on a very rough basis. You take air into your lungs, and then you push it through uh, the larynx, and there you have the vocal folds, which, which start to vibra vibrate. And this vibration then propagates further into the pharynx and into the oral cavity, and there you have all different kinds of things like the tongue and the teeth and the lips, which then form the sound that is then expelled through, through your mouth, which, enco which encodes information, which lets me communicate with you at, right now. How did this work with the euphonia? We had a bellows over there that was something uh, like a lung that would then expunge air um, in the direction of this tube. I think I'll go back to the other picture that was nicer. Yeah, here you can see it a bit more clearly where you, you'd had something that imitated the vocal folds, which would start vibrating, 
and then would be expelled here through this kind of synthetic mouth, um, which also featured a synthetic tongue, which then would form the sounds that were produced by this machine. What I, again, thought is, is memorable is on top of that mouth that you had, um, which was had a mechanical function, you had a head modeled around this. And to me, th this again looks rather feminine. Maybe this inventor, he's called Faba, uh, who was a German immigrant in the US, was inspired uh, by the literature that came before. <laughs> Maybe uh, it w he designed this to his own whims. We don't know. Sadly, this machine was destroyed in a fit of rage by its inventor because it didn't uh, get the appreciation from the public that he had hoped for. Going further through time, now with the new uh, media of film, uh, we still have the same trope, which can be seen in Metropolis, a uh, uh, silent film masterpiece directed by Fritz Lang. The basic story is of a big uh, metropolitan city that is uh, reigned over by a big capitalist boss called Friedersen and um, a working class which keeps the machines of the city and the city as such running. And we have the son of um, that uh, capitalist boss of everything, uh, Frida, who descends down into the lower parts of the city and discovers the workers and tries to um, get to help them because uh, the one woman, Maria, from that part of the city starts a workers' revolution against uh, the guys above. In answer to this, Friedersen uh, reaches out to an inventor who has built a robot. You can see it here. In the film, it's called Der Maschinenmensch, like the machine human, and it gets further modified. Um, the inventor captures Maria and then forms the robot in her image which is then used uh, to subvert the workers' uprising. And again, we have here the trope of a masculine inventor using a feminine creation to execute his will. At the same time, um, coming back to um, technology, I think this, this is a switchboard, and these are switchboard operators. At the, this time, the telephone uh, was uh, in, not invented, but then really got it getting into use. And um, I think this is important or concerning this talk, because I can imagine this being the first time when uh, you use a machine and it speaks back to you in a feminine voice. Then, of course, we could ask again yet, why do we have uh, mostly women in this switchboard positions? One reason is, um, like in the telegraph system that was um, important during the war. Most men at that time were um, being out at the front fighting, and then these positions that got um, were empty in communication, telegraph and uh, telephone systems were then um, filled up with women. After the war, this really didn't change. I heard uh, from people that this was because of the signal processing that um, because of the noise on the, on the wires, you would understand and discern higher-pitched voices more easily than lower-pitched voices. I think that's, uh, and that sounds like a good story, but I didn't find sources for that. And I also think that there are other reasons that are more probable. One rather important one is that you could pay a female um, switchboard operator a half to a quarter of the salary of a man. And, of course, they were also perceived as being more hospitable, uh, more polite, and more ser serving to the customers. Now, getting closer to voice synthesis, this is the 1939 presentation of the voter. This is a very early speech synthesis device that was developed by Bell Labs. And it's interesting because here we have um, 
not the mechanical generation of sound that we had before in the Euphonia device, but here we have uh, one that is powered by two oscillators, which then modulate the signal that um, sounds more, um, or which, which sounds the most close uh, to what, how human speech sounds like. But this still, again, uh, was operated, had needed operation by someone. You had a kind of keyboard um, that uh, you had to press and learn how to control to exactly modify the signal that was generated to have the speech that you want. I can't afford a carriage, but you look sweet up on a seat of a bicycle made for two. This might sound familiar. My instructor was Mr. Langley and he taught me to sing a song. If you'd like to hear it, I can sing it for you. Yes, I'd like to hear it now. Sing it for me. It's called Daisy. I hope that was discernible. So why do I bring up this example when I wanted to talk about feminine machines? The thing about the voter, in the 50s, Arthur C. Clarke visited Bell Labs and he encountered just that speech synthesizer that could sing that way. And he was so impressed by this that he uh, took inspiration from it and, as you've seen, took uh, the song that could be sung by the voter and um, implemented it in the script for HAL 9000. That you was like, okay, HAL 9000 also sounds pretty masculine. Why is this important for this? I would argue um, this plays a role because HAL 9000 was one of the earliest and very um, present speech synthesizers or speech synthesis systems um, that was in the public. Of course, not in use, but uh, in the popular uh, movie 2001 A Space Odyssey. Uh, that was, I think, came out 1969. And I can imagine that um, f developers that later wanted to develop speech synthesis system tried to avoid masculine sounding voices, computerized voices, to avert an association with the character of Hall 9000, which is the antagonist of this story. I think this is uh, one of the points that really got me um, excited in the research for this, because here we have technological innovation having an impact on how science fiction portrays machines, and we'll have that later again, but the other way around. Coming to contemporary science fiction, I could talk a lot about feminine machine characters in science fiction and movies, but I'm sorry, that will be a whole mouthful. I could do a whole own talk about this, so I'd rather um, stay with two examples that are more relevant for this topic. One of them, latest uh, published movie, is called Ex Machina, where we have this Pygmalion and Galatea setting overall again. We have Nathan, CEO of big tech company, big data, big boss, whatever, who um, sits in his bunker home somewhere in Norway, um, only reachable by a helicopter, and is working on his own sentient machines. Uh, spoiler, sorry. He has not only one, but he has multiple, and oh, what a surprise. They look pretty 
curvy and feminine, I would argue. And then he um, invites one of his top uh, programmers, that's Carla, um, to ha have him execute a Turing test on Ava, that's her name. Of course, this is not really a Turing test because he knows beforehand that she's a machine and what this is really about, but okay, the Turing test is also about deception. Ava's actual purpose is uh, to execute um, Nathan's experiment to look if she can manipulate Caleb into helping her escape from this facility, facility in which um, they're in. And oops, that actually happens. And she stabs her creator and she leaves Caleb behind to die and is free to the world. On the other hand side, maybe a, a bit contrasting narrative is um, Spike Jones' film Her where we have um, the protagonist here, uh, Ducky. That was your, your partner, what was his name? Theodore, thanks Ducky. Yes, <coughs> protagonist Theodore, who uh, works for an internet company, ghostwriting personal handwritten letters for others. Um, Puth is rather unhappy with his own life. He was married, is in divorce, but he's really not ready for it. And then he downloads a new operating system onto his devices, which um, has its own personality, which is, uh, is a conscious AI, and starts talking to him. And what is a bit different from the other films, maybe, um, is that it's not the editors which simply suppose uh, which gender this machine has, but he or the character is able to choose. In the beginning, he's asked, would you like your OS to be female or, ma or male. He said, yeah, I'd like her to be female. Her name is Samantha, and then they go on um, developing a relationship, um, growing on each other and learning from each other. And I think where this is um, different from the other movies is that um, Samantha, which is the name of the US, then develops, she develops a will of her own, her own needs. and decides to depart from the relationship. Now, speaking of uh, virtual assistants, looking at what we have today and how um, the virtual assistants we have are characterized, um, here's one example from the virtual assistant Microsoft has made. Uh, it's called Cortana. And it's not called that for by accident, that they were, let's say, inspired by a video, a video game character. This is Cortana from the Halo video game series. In that series, she is also like personal AI assistant to uh, the main protagonist, Master Chief. And here again, we find that phenomenon um, that we had before with Bell Labs and Arthur C. Clarke, just the other way around. Here, um, technology companies who develop these devices are inspired by what is, um, has already been done and developed in science fiction. Now, so far I've always talked about how these voices are feminine or that these machines are female. This is something I have to say um, about this. Going after Judith Butler, gender is performative. And so none of these voices or devices are inherently female of any kind. But what they do is they perform a certain kind of femininity. And I also want to stress that there's not one femininity, but it's, there's a huge range of femininities that can be performed. And these devices are designed to a rather narrow space of femininity. How is that executed, or how is this designed in different virtual assistants? Or, oh, that's, I think that question was later on. Ducky, did you, did you mess with the slides? That was, I think, that's one more screen. That I just forgot that? Thank you. Why would a designer choose a feminine voice over a masculine voice for such an assistant? I've uh, been digging and I've found a study by a um, former professor of communication, Clifford Nass, who has um, done some work with um, voice interaction or voice, um, 
as a medium to interact with machines and computers, who found that people tend to perceive female voices as helping us to solve our problems by ourselves, while they view male voices as authority figures who tell us the answers to our problems. I don't believe that this is anything inherent in male or female voices, but of course, this reflects um, gender stereotypes that we have in our society. Adding to that, not only this, let's say, market re research factor comes into it, but I think it's important to consider where these devices are used and which expectations arise from that usage. My mother recently told me that she got a Google Home uh, for her apartment. For what? Because she wanted to regulate the heating. Um, a friend of mine has an Amazon Alexa at home, and what does he use that for? He, use it, he uses it to switch on the kitchen ventilation, so he doesn't have to stand up or switch on the lights uh, or switch off the lights at night. Um, another assistant which you might not have heard about is Xiao Ice. This is something like the um, newcomer after um, Microsoft's Tay. Um, Xiao Ice is also a conversational bot, mostly used in China, or it's very popular in China at least, where people interact with it day to day just as they would interact with a friend, sending pictures, um, asking what's up, and just having little chit chat. And um, what I've seen in multiple advertisements for visual assistants of people who just um, tell their device, like, hey, make me an appointment next week, or send a message to my boss, an email. And I would subsume this under secretary work. And all of these domains, like domestic tasks, giving advice, listening, doing secretary work, all of this is work that we usually associate with work that women do. That's why I can understand that this might be an easy choice for a designer who thinks, okay, people would expect in such an, an, work environment, such an environment that women do this work, so I'll design my um, device with a female voice. <coughs> But it's not only adding to this uh, performance of femininity, it's not only like the usage and the naming and um, the design of the voice as such, but it's also the interaction patterns. When you ask Siri, are you a woman? Siri says, I do not have a gender, like cacti or certain species of fish. Other questions in the same direction is, if we ask Siri, that she might tell us more about herself or who she actually is. And she's eva evading, evading and deflecting. And this reminds me of a sort of vintage femininity, of not making yourself seen, of, of not being any disturbance, just being there, serving your function, but not actually talking about yourself and being present as yourself. I understand why this design decision is made, because of course, these devices they are services. They are not personalities. They just try to pretend to be personalities. And that's why in their speech behavior, of course, when it comes to themselves, it comes to themselves. They'll try deflecting and trying asking about other things, what they can do for the consumer or the user. But it's not only the behavior of um, the device as such, but I also think that the user behavior says something about how we gender these devices. I did a little search on um, the video portal of my least mistrust, um, looking because I've seen that people like to flirt with Siri and um, or I don't know what you would call it. If I would really call it flirting, maybe f starting out flirting, being more creepy, getting more harassing. And from these answers, they unsettle me because I think, yes, this is how you would react if you want to in further engage in that conversation. 
because this device once is designed to stay serviceable, um, to be at hand, always be listening. But it's also a, react a pattern of communication that I see in uh, myself when uh, people try to harass me, harass me, and also that is encoded into um, a gender role of femininity, of not trying to be aggressive, not trying to um, set someone back, just trying to deflect and kind of very softly, gently, politely wiggle myself out of the, out of the situation. But I don't think that this is a way that you can avert harassment. Silence won't protect you. But that something like that, I think, is also um, can also be seen in the um, case of Tay, the Twitter bot uh, aforementioned that was developed by Microsoft. That was so, Tay was supposed to be like a public Twitter bot that you could train with your own conversations, and then people on message boards decided, hey, let's let's mess with her head, uh, and trained her to say um, sexist. Uh, racist, homophobic things. Of course, this is all, only speculation because Tay was uh, taken, pretty taken down pretty quickly. But I wonder if uh, this would have happened if it was not Tay, but maybe Taylor. I think um, this quote from Jacqueline Feldman, who is a New York-based writer and journalist, who also wrote a terrific article on um, conversational bots. This quote sums it up pretty neatly. By creating interactions that encourage consumers to understand the objects that serve them as women, technologists abet the prejudice by which women are considered objects. After all, it must speak agreeably. It must not disclose opinions or biographical information, as it has none. It must always answer, and the answers must delight. Well, I've um, been to uh, a lot of places that I find critical because um, identifying um, the subservient and the obedient that these machines that we use as instruments for ourselves display, connecting that to the feminine, for me, is a bit... I have difficulties with that because it perpetuates a notion of um, to, uh, that femi feminine things or people are obje objectified already. But aside um, next to those, those critical points, of course, I think um, speech synthesizers and speech interfaces can have really good uses. I mean, here we have Stephen Hawking, who of course was not only visible in the public as someone who has a speech synthesizer to communicate, but of course also a researcher and a um, popular, uh, popular science writer. And much, much later, of course, he then is someone who is um, displayed in the public and is uh, able to communicate and have a voice because of these technologies. Another project that I found online is this one. It's called Cyber Galactioni, um, and it's a group of programmers and artists who try to resurrect uh, a Georgian poet and writer on the basis of his interviews, of his books. I think this could be a very interesting um, way for education, to interact and get to know more about people from the past. Um, I haven't talked about Eliza so far, but I think also sh uh, this um, device belongs in here. Eliza, to those who don't know, was um, a chat bot that was built by Josef Weizenbaum. And um, it was like a thera therapeutic chat bot who uh, would um, mirror to you what you, s uh, you said yourself. Like, if I said, yeah, I don't know, I just came back from work, I had a hard day and had an argument with, you, with my boss, and then the program would respond, your boss? And it would just would let the user keep talking and talking about yourself and then coming to introspection. 
After Weizenbaum wrote this thing, actually he wrote this thing to show people that um, uh, machine devices could never live up, live up to uh, some uh, a person with presence. He then found his secretary talking to Eliza about the troubles with her boyfriend. Um, and although I would agree with him that I think it's the wrong, um, it's dangerous to assert responsibility to a, a machine agent, I do think that uh, devices like Eliza could help with introspection. When I'm conscious of um, the fact that this thing I'm interacting with is not a present um, listening other, but more like a mirror, which helps me to introspect myself. And of course, um, in cars, navigational systems are a really handy thing. When I have to get my, um, put my eyes somewhere else, then um, it's neat to have a voice to interact with me, to give me information where to go um, on and where it might be dangerous on the road ahead. Yet, my criticism for this is, I don't think we should design just for what the market wants. If we do this, we create a self-fulfilling prophecy. If we believe people like feminine voices more, then of course they will be subjected to mostly feminine voices, and then of course they know that, they um, get habitu habituated to that, and then they like that more. But they never um, get the opportunity to um, experience a greater diversity. As again, uh, example of Eliza, I also think it's important to not take responsibility away from the users. Yes, a feminine voice might be something that is more trustworthy, but do I want to be more trustworthy in a device that sits in my home and listens to everything I say, um, collecting data for people who uh, maybe just want to um, have better marketing for me, or who want to know if I'm a suspect, or who just give it right away to the NSA? I don't think that voice synthesis technologies should compromise my me media literacy. Coming back to um, the example with Tay, or with the way that um, people might flirtatiously harass other conversational bots, we teach children not to be cruel to animals. Of course, also because we care for animal well-being, but also because we don't want children to be habituated to being cruel towards animals, which then may also bleed over to being cruel towards humans. Especially when bots are mostly feminine, I think this applies just the same way. And when I imagine, of course, with the Internet of Things, maybe, maybe more and more devices will be, uh, able, will be able to control uh, via voice, maybe. My toothbrush, uh, my mirror, my fridge, my car, and I feel uneasy when I imagine that I reign about this uh, realm of mine with all my feminine devices that are obedient to me and that serve me. I don't think that helps to um, get away this, uh, the ever so, uh, the already present object objectification of the feminine. And I also believe that in um, total, the voices that we hear now, or in the devices that we use, should also display the diversity of the world. Thank you. For that, um, Maybe if you can take something from this talk. I want to give a shout out to a Mozilla project called Common Voice, uh, where they are building an open source uh, speech synthesis and um, control, um, well, like speaking devices and also listening devices um, that are, uh, have broader diversity, that speak in more broader voices, or and also are trained to a bigger database so more people can also interact with these devices. And here, you can donate your voice to contribute to that um, database. Yeah, let's do that. Oh, thank yeah. you, Polaris. It was really fine to hear.
Uh, I'm wondering if we have some, yeah, take something to drink. If we have questions from the audience here. Someone, uh, yes, I see some people. Microphone two, please, can you? Hi, I've got a very quick question about sort of the idea of emotional labor and feminism, how it plays into this. Because there's been some studies on how people are using increasingly tools such as Siri for, for example, emotional support to talk to them when they're having a bad time, etc. And some recent feminist research has shown that sort of men vastly over rely on women for emotional labor rather than men. So do you think that there's a notable difference in the degree to which, for example, people would overuse Siri when Siri has a feminine voice for emotional labor versus Siri with a masculine voice for emotional labor? As with Eliza, I think I see the possibility in these devices to help with introspection, but I think it's as important to reach out to your surrounding um, to have a sense of trust and building, because giving or doing emotional labor for each other, of course, also um, enhances uh, your relationship uh, with the people around you, with your friends or your partner. Did that answer your question? A bit here, thanks. Is it? I, mean, I just wanted to, so if I can just do a very quick follow-up, what I just found very interesting is that, do you know of maybe any research that has been done on whether or not people are using bots with male and female personalities different for emotional support? Like, do you know if there's been any research done on whether or not people talk differently to, for example, female Siri or feminine Siri and masculine Siri about emotional issues? No, but that would be a really interesting research question. Thank you. I have to dive deeper into that, I think. Uh, microphone one, there is a question. Okay, um, do you want to comment on the one uh, part where computer voices are often male and also an authority figure, and that is um, in uh, aircraft autopilots. They tell you to pull up on a bad day, and that is a male voice. To, to know that. Uh, and therefore, like. It's, it's an authority really figure, being and it is male. Okay, yeah. yeah, thank you for that addition. Who of you uh, has tools that, that he or she, or in Swedish there is a word for the. Hen. Hen, indeed, for the undefined. Who of you has a, a tool, or a machine, or a, a device, or a, as a character? I have some things. None of you. I'm the only one. No. One is there, there is another one, there is another one. And the others say, just see this as things then. Right. I hope you're Zen, because then you see as well the value of it as Earth provides us. But okay. Microphone three. So, first, I want to say thank you very much for your talk. I think it was one of the best ones I heard on the whole week. Ah. <laughs> um, right. I wanted to ask um, if you can say something about like usually which um, population or which group of people can afford um, speech devices and how this may interact with that this is a female kind of service like for example we have pictures of really smart home, which are like for really rich people, which are usually white and male. And this is connected then to your smart home with always the female voice. Yeah, maybe if you know something about that or can comment on that. I would say, of course, um, like income and wealth is a factor if you get such a device or not. Um, I know of a project where they wanted to outfit um, like a home for the elderly with more smart home devices, but I guess, of course, these are more pricey, so also might be um, uh, or more the wealthier population that can access that. Otherwise, mm, also, as, as before, would be an interesting research question to look into that, but I don't know more about. Uh, someone on the internet or is life out there, it seems. Is it, uh, 
yeah. male, female, or... So, I have a question from internet. So, they choose a female voice in the fighter jets because the pilot was statistically more likely to listen and save the aircraft and his life. And the question is, uh, what is your take on that? <laughs> Do you understand the question? I hope so. So, uh... I can add that this. Uh, there is actually a voice uh, called uh, Beaching Betty, if I know about it. Pardon? Can I add one more time? The Beaching Betty. Beaching. Like, oh. The, there is actually the study based on the military research for 75. Okay, let's, let's answer the first question. So, what do I think about pilots rather not crashing planes that have female voices? Did I get it correctly? <laughs> okay. Um, well. <laughs> it's not like my car. R Ruby is my car, but yeah. Hmm. I could imagine that maybe a general plays into that, that men try to be more dominant, uh, uh, try to prove their dominance to other men. And maybe if they project a male gender onto that plane, they'll try to um, like uh, master it up and, and try to prove it to the plane, and maybe then they're not really that concentrating on getting the landing right. Just a thesis. <laughs> and if they hear like this soothing female voice, like <laughs> that is so, so common in, in these devices, they might think like, oh, I have a responsibility for me and also the others, so I'd rather not get angry or frustrated and just get this shit done. I don't know. It's a, a question there. Is, is it uh, the interaction with your plane? Is, is that as well female there then, in, in that case? Um, I don't think there are like uh, speech or conversational devices on planes, but I know that in emergen ah. emergency situations, there is a voice uh, uh, to try to capture the um, yeah, and attention that, of the And pilot. that's female. Seems so, uh, if I understand knows? it correctly. But Okay, uh, someone in the audience said that uh, it's different in some airlines, it's um, rather feminine, or in other airlines it's male. Uh, microphone two, we have an answer, I suppose. Uh, it's anecdotal from my point of view. I've heard in the uh, Vietnam, uh, during the Vietnam War, the Americans tested uh, to the ways of grabbing the attention if, some were, if there occurred some malfunctions. And uh, anecdotally, they used uh, female voices and even the voices of the children of the pilots, if they had any. Uh, children. Dad, That's manipulative. Dad, <laughs> well, give my attention. Children. And after that, they could share your right to motors out of order or something. Purely anecdotal, uh, I ha was somewhat ex uh, expecting you to touch that. And uh, while I'm at it. Konrad Lorenz had some studies way back in the 50s, I think, about attention, and I think that would be uh, interesting to take his point of categorizing, categorizing the attention mechanisms into your studies as well. Thank you. It's a, something to look up. Uh, uh, microphone three, please. <coughs> Thank you for your talk. Uh, it was very relevant and very, very good. <laughs> I liked it. Uh, in your talk, you, you didn't mention anything about uh, Marshall McLuhan, so I, I don't know if you know about him, but he's... Uh, yes, he's a media theorist. Yes, yes. So one of his points is that uh, any medium amplifies or accelerates existing human processes. And in your examples, uh, you've, or you have, you've made a lot of good examples about um, the gender dimorphism in our culture throughout history. Uh, so my question is maybe... Uh, well, sorry, another, another point of McLuhan is that the medium itself is more important than the, the content. So here I would definitely be using voice Mozilla, but that, that seems to be about uh, changing the content 
and not changing the media. Mm. I, I wouldn't um, necessarily say this. Uh, of course, there are different ways that you can synthesize speech, and um, the voices that are mostly used in these devices uh, have a certain fundamental frequency that is uh, higher pitched, or also have certain speech patterns. I think tinkering around with that and experimenting to get more diversity there is, um, would change a part of the medium, or the format, and not the content. But yeah. then uh, do you have uh, any ideas for other types of media that we might explore instead of this uh, voice assistance? I would say uh, robotics. Uh, is certainly also something that is subject to that. Um, when looking into it, I saw a lot of also like fembots or f robots that try to perform a certain femininity. And also there, I think, why do we need this? Of course, people design them like that because they want to use it in, in the care area and in care work. But I think tackling this um, on, on different levels is not only um, a good way to go at at um, prejudices about femininity and the female, but also around masculinity. Of course, also um, when we have, we could also use male voices uh, in more devices to perpetuate that yes, also men can be trusted, can be helpful, can be polite. I would suggest that we actually do something, a test here with the elevators, for instance, uh, in this building, and change the voice and then do a kind of inquiry about it, isn't it? <laughs> put some, a children voice in it and, and scream like, oh no, not to number two or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> would be, you know, to just a test. Microphone one, please. Let's. Yes, I was, I was wondering whether it might also be something maternal. So from my impression, I know some people that seem to be looking lifelong for the caring mother that tells them what to do and that somehow uh, also I think this is not only for ma men but also for some women. So um, could it be also a maternal thing that these voices are female? I guess I lack uh, the background in psychology to, to really answer that. Um, I would just like uh, give me very, my own general knowledge, which might not be uh, the best basis for that. Okay. But also a good question, maybe to look into that. Thank you. Right. We go to microphone two. Hey, thanks for the talk. It was really good. Um, I was wondering, since you researched on, on the subject and you kind of gave it as a concluding uh, thing in your talk, um, what would be a way that we then really diversify those, um, I mean, speech synthesizers and voices that we talk to? Could we imagine <laughs> bots taking shifts and sometimes you talk to, uh, I don't know, a man voice and sometimes it's a female voice that answer you? Or, should we rely on beeps and blobs rather than actual uh, speech synthesizer talking back to you? Do you have any like insight on this? I think the first, uh, um, I would, the first answer I would give to that is, I think, in the beginning, con um, a consciousness about this is important. To realize, oh, OK, there's so many like devices that speak feminine to me, uh, and that, that might is perpetuating the idea or the notion that femininity is um, objectified and that these two belong together. I think this is the starting point. Uh, and as I said, the Mozilla project uh, is something that I would look forward to also to uh, get the night my voice. Um, because I think that's a good way, like have a more diverse uh, training set uh, or for uh, maybe the, some voice synthesis is done uh, with neural networks. Um, so that they train on that. And then maybe, of course, trying to uh, get this into public. Yeah, let's uh, raise that number maybe today, if we have the chance. Uh, number three, please, three. Um, what do you think about neutral voices? Totally doable. <laughs> well, if if uh, um, I don't believe that we have to rely on this binary. I think we already acknowledge that people do not fit in that binary. Why should our machines do that? But usually the female voices are very 
stereotype female. So if you take a voice where you cannot define whether it's like a very female or a very male voice, because there are some people where you, you hear the voice and if you don't see the person, you cannot tell immediately what it, if it's a male or a female person. So why not just do it with the voices? And then you don't even have to think about whether it's male or female. I believe because, at least speaking for me, because of the way that I was raised, the socialization I got, um, I um, get, uh, when I see people, the first impulse I have is try to, is, is it a man, is it a woman? And then I realize like, hey, maybe that person just doesn't care. And I think that was a learning process for me. And I think the same also happens with voices that in the beginning, when we hear, hear them for the first time, we're like, oh, is it, a, is it female, is it male? But I think through um, a spreading a, a consciousness about this, that this reflects uh, also gender stereotypes we have in our society, um, people might get more um, open to this and more used to this. Does that answer your question? Yes. I, huh? <laughs> but I think, why not use this moment now to make the world more open and then also put it back in the normal world where people don't have to think about like gender too much maybe now it's the time when you can just do it with those voices people get used to it and then they, it's not a big issue anymore if it's a male or a female in general but thank you <laughs> that's, that's a good approach let's do that yeah number two hello nice talk and uh, I think what I like to brought up is maybe we like female voices because they are high and we are programmed to really give our attention to female, to high-pitched voices because children have mostly high-pitched voices and we are programmed to care for them. For example, cats also meow in uh, high, um, higher, pitch. higher pitches to get our attention and maybe that's the reason why we really want to hear something like that. I don't know how about you, but I'm not programmed. Like I have a, a brain made of um, bi uh, biological neurons. Um, I also thought about that, that my, my, this might be something that uh, gets attention. But on the other side, um, also people that um, come perform a certain authority also get attention. So I think, yeah, that might be a point, but I don't think um, it can, uh, it equalizes the other effects, for example, that we associate a lower pitch with a more author authority performing voice. We can have one last question, sir. A yeah, very short question. Did you, did you find any counter examples, any <coughs> cruel, proactive female voices on uh, automata in culture? Did, did you find any counterexamples of the thesis uh, by uh, uh, some female automata or f automata with female voices which act in a cruel and proactive way in some cultural artifacts? about like Ghost in the Shell, Major Kusanagi. I think she's pretty cool and, and going for herself, but well, she's not like a voice um, synthesizer. But what I found is in like one of the, those rather creepy videos of people um, flirting with Siri, I found one example where Siri then just responded after being um, um, harassed all the time, like, okay, that's it. I'm uh, going to the digital agents uh, union and reporting your harassment. I was like, yes, which engineer put this in? I want more of that. <laughs> <laughs> Polaris, thank you. I will, would love to, uh, actually, I would love to do a call to change the voices in the elevators here and really to have a test <laughs> next year. It would, would be really fun, man. <laughs> yeah. uh, thank you for your fantastic talk. I'm really looking forward to whatever we're going to do with it. Uh, Thank you audience as well, give a warm applause as well to Polaris.